All right, guys, uh, this is Brian from Starlight Pulp. Thank you so much for coming by. And uh, this is the episode four of the Starlight Pulp cast. And tonight, uh, I've got a bit of a, uh, a renaissance man. I've got a uh, writer, uh, filmmaker, artist, and everything in between, uh, Mr. Jim Towns with us tonight. So how you doing, Jim? Hey, I'm really good, Brian. Thanks for having me on. I really, uh, I'm, I'm excited to do this. This is great. Absolutely, man. Looking forward to it. So, so, so you are um, in many ways kind of a horror aficionado. I, I, I hope so. Yeah. I mean, you know, <laughs> I, I like to think so. It's been, it's been a, a key part of my upbringing. Um, I think it filters into everything I do. If I, if I'm, if I'm hosting a podcast, it's there definitely. If I'm writing a book, it's there definitely, mm -hmm. and if I'm making directing writing directing a film, it's it's there too. So it it permeates the whole lot of of my creative endeavors. So it, it is one, and you can look at my place. I've got House of Frankenstein, and <laughs> right. you know you know heads heads from you know films I tried to make, and I've got Bride of Frankenstein pillows and there you go, all the yeah. lamps, and so it's it's who I am. And it, it, there's something to be said for just embracing what you are and, and leading into it. And, and as I've gotten older, I've realized that's the secret to, to make yourself happy. Just Heck yeah. lean into the things that make you happy. If they don't hurt anybody else, celebrate those things, man. All right. So, so I, it, it occurs to me and, 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 you know, make whatever adjustments you want to along the way. I, but it, it occurs to me that there are certain periods that are really kind of special for, certain genres let's say let's say you're a huge you know uh noir guy and you yes. and 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 you're growing up in the early to late 50s that's a great time period for that right right, right. i kind of feel like you and i because we're relatively close in age i kind of feel like you and i have had a little bit of a cheat code growing <laughs> up in the 80s because because oh, yeah. we're between science fiction and horror, right? We had, you know, you, you had Spielberg with you know Close Encounters and and ET, and there was Poltergeist, and you had the George Lucas stuff, and you had Star Wars, and and it really was, it wasn't they weren't just movies; they were iconic kind of moments and and they and for us they cultural were, touchstone moments absolutely 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 and, absolutely and 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 for us they we grew up with them but i think you know i think the other what you just said i, I totally agree with and the thing i really think resonates is that you're growing up with um steven spielberg doing raiders of lost ark which is a, a callback to his, his and lucas's more lucas really like childhood enjoying the 40s and 50s serials which yeah yeah yeah, the, yeah it's like king of the rocket men and 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 zombies at the stratosphere all the all the rocketeer stuff but it's also darkest africa and mm -hmm. and and all the pulpy uh we could argue kind of noirish mm -hmm. serials too Absolutely. um you've got john carpenter doing a halloween and then the thing which is a callback to the original thing from the 50s which is frankly oh. a really noirish science fiction horror movie oh, about, oh. It's all about paranoia right Jim, by the but way, the bridges to those, we could appreciate these. We found these things through the people that we liked who were creating entertainment. Oh, absolutely. When we absolutely. were, alone. yeah, absolutely. And 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 by the way, just just to throw this in there, I had no idea you were going to bring up the thing, but uh, my grandpa did the special effects on the original the thing. Get the heck out of here! <laughs> yeah, the the, yeah. the Howard Hawks Christian Eby film. Yeah, yeah. Get he, the heck out of here! That's incredible. Yeah, um, he was a he was a special effects guy. He did a he did a bunch of uh, John Wayne movies. Some Mitchum. Yeah. Um, he did Suddenly with Sinatra. But yeah, he he did the thing and the thing from another world. The the Howard Hawks, the James Arness film, uh, mm -hmm. Christian Newby directed. Uh, um, it's my. It's my number one science fiction film. It's my go-to. I'll really? watch it. I, I, it's, it's up next to my Blu-ray player in the living room right now. I swear wow. to God. I've been meaning to watch it. I've, I've been focused on a lot of horror the last year or two, obviously, because I host a horror podcast. But, yeah, yeah. but as far as a horror movie, first of all, it's a horror movie. Second of all, it's, it is such an amazingly put together uh, study of character and study of characters under stress in, in a, in a small yeah, social yeah, yeah. environment. And so that, it, you know, it's, it's, it's one of those films guys. And if anyone listening, 
Thing from Another World, 1955. I want to say I'm not sure. I might I may be wrong with the date. Anyway, 1950s, uh, 53 maybe. Um, it's a it's an absolute masterpiece. And if you watch John Carpenter's The Thing, which is much more well known to a later day, audience, yeah, yeah, you can see all the influences back. And you can actually watch if you watch Halloween on Halloween night. Jamie, Jamie Lee Curtis is the kid she's babysitting is watching The Thing from Another World. I mean, <laughs> put gotcha. it in that too. Like that's how, that's how much he loved that film and, and, and I love it too. So yeah. Gotcha. Okay. Absolutely right. No, that's insane. That's so cool. Your, your grandma. Yeah, right. yeah, no. So, so, so talk to me though about, uh, okay. So I brought this up with the out of the podcast guys in uh, the first episode and we were talking about remakes mm -hmm. and in a lot of ways, and and I'm gonna I'm gonna defer to you here 100% be, because you're the you're the horror guy. In a lot of ways, uh, Carpenter's the thing is kind of looked at as superior to a lot of people. You know, I uh, yeah, I, I think so. I think it definitely resonates with the modern audience more than more than watching this old black and white thing, which has. Okay. Um, for as much as I love it, yeah, I mean, to a modern audience, there's a few creaky moments in it, and that's just the <laughs> nature of that's the nature of our filmmaking. Was uh, oh, of course, yeah, um, yeah. I I, th I think there's there's a lot of talk about remakes and reboots in in popular culture now and on social media and everything, right? Of course, um, and are they all amazing? No, uh, some are some of them. Yes, are mm -hmm. a lot of them cash grabs? Yeah, sure. But that's what that's what studios do. They grab cash. If yeah. if they think making an original film is going to grab them cash, they'll do that. If they think sure. remaking something is going to gra grab them cash, they'll do that because they have stockholders, because they have boards of directors that they yeah. have to answer to. So of course they have jobs they have to protect. So that's just the way that goes. Um, I host the Board to Go Past Horror podcast, which um, we're in our second year now. We were nominated for a Rondo award last year uh, we lost to to um to, to gilbert godfrey's podcast uh, who, uh who's now long since passed so so with all respect to right. gilbert godfrey i think we can i think we have him beat this year um uh but on the podcast you know we we're we're 30 some episodes in and, and we talk about this we talk about how you know we we think of the remakes and reboots as a recent phenomenon mm -hmm. in the 80s on um the thing uh, cat people was a remake um you know all these movies um oh, yeah. and then their remake and and it has it has sped up quite a bit we're we're remaking things very yeah quickly, you know. yeah but, but yeah. universe you know first of all all the big studios when sound came out the first thing they did was remake as many of the sound films they'd made as possible in sound um dracula would have is a remake of of london after midnight the, mm -hmm. the lon cheney senior film so they were doing it constantly Borg, uh, Borg, the uh, Universal Studios it, it itself made two films called The Black Cat within 11 years. Right. Because they just re they they did a new movie called Black Cat and they it was a different story and they had cast different actors. <laughs> really, right. Who would because back then there was no home video and there was no right, you, right, right, there was right, no yeah. chance someone was going to go back and yeah. watch something again. You didn't have that capability. So so they're like who will remember that? Let's put another one out. We'll put Basil right. Rathbone in this one. Who cares? You know. Right, yeah, right, right. Like, <laughs> um, so that's just the nature of things. So, so, so that's my, that's my spiel on, on, on remakes. I think, you know what, it, it just comes down to, did they, I think, did the filmmakers come into it with a pure intent? Um, did they, did, did they hire good people to make it? And did the people who make it, make it their own thing? Did they, did they, did they take the best of what was inspired, what inspired it? And sure. Turn, turn, do the best version. Of it. And the same goes with sequels. That's just, it's all yeah. you can do. And, and, right. and being on the other side of the camera as, as I what like what I do for a living. Right. Um, that's the best you can do in those circumstances. So you just have to judge. I think you just judge each film, each book, each piece, whatever on its own merits. Okay. That's fair. Yeah. So, so, uh, I kind of, it might sound like a strange concept, but I kind of look at, at each artist, okay, regardless of what it is we do, um, each artist, we all have kind of our own uh, origin story, sure. if you want to look at it that way, right? There you go. Uh, so, and, and so if I were to write my origin story, notice I said write because that's the first thing that comes to my mind, right? <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> so, so it would, it would be, mine would include uh, Stephen King, Raymond Chandler, um, Kerouac, Bukowski, Edward Hopper. <laughs> nice. Um, yeah, yeah. And and you know, there's there. 
And the funny part was, like, I would read Stephen King all the time. Still do. Um, I, in fact, in one of the essays that you have on your WordPress page, you you mentioned that it seemed like Stephen King had a new book out every 17 days. In the, oh, 80s. The, the, the one about the 80s. Yeah. And, yeah. and it did. Right. It still kind of does. Like, <laughs> he, he still. Yeah. Puts, right. He's 70 something and he still puts out a book every every nine months or something, um, which is just just amazing. But uh, as much as I read King and I did, uh, I didn't uh, I. I didn't look at King and go, I, I can do that, funny mm -hmm. enough. Whereas I read Chandler and I went, oh, I can do that. You know, I was like 12 or yeah. 13 and of course yeah. I couldn't do it. But the point was that my thought, my thinking was I can do that um, or I could do that. If if you were to write your own kind of origin story that way, what what would what would the influences be? I, okay. Um. <laughs> uh. I mean, part and parcel to it has to be a lot of the wonderful 80s films, that, 70s and into 80s films that, that I grew up. So I was born in 74. Um, I was too young to see Star Wars when it came out. I was three. Right? Okay. Um, but I saw Empire Strikes Back when it came mm. out. And then I went back and they, re they replayed Star Wars in the theaters back then and, and saw that. So, so that, that trilogy factored large into, into my thing. Um, sure. And then moving to the 80s into Raiders of the Lost Ark, which has honestly serious horror movie moments within it you know sure um, sure yeah into dante stuff um uh gremlins uh um and into like the howling and and, and things like that so so about like third fourth grade i'm starting to get into spookier stuff and mm -hmm. if there's this is funny if there's one film that i probably have to credit to like who i am right now uh -huh. it's got to be abbott and costello meet frankenstein <laughs> because you younger listeners have to imagine a time where there was no home video. There was no VHS. Right. There was no, Oh yeah. Yeah. No. There was no streaming services. There was nothing. There was only what the television networks chose to show you. Um, I, I was reading the, um, I was blank on the names of these. There were, there were the, the books that had the stories of the, the, the universal monster books, movies. Oh, okay. Movies. Yeah. A uh, Crestwood house, Crestwood house. Um, that sounds right. And yeah. they were in my, my grade school library. And I was, I would read the book about, Frankenstein meets the Wolfman, and I was fascinated with this. But there was nowhere to see it. There was nowhere locally right. in my where I grew up in Pittsburgh that was showing these things. The thing that was showing on Sunday mornings on on WPTT twenty two was right. the Abner Costello movie the hour, and very often they would show Abner Costello meet Frankenstein. So it was my only input to watching this. <laughs> right. It, this get it, right. my only input into this world until. Like third grade, when my brother Chip got a a, a, a VHS player, a VCR, and I was starting to be able to rent. Like suddenly, I was able to rent like The Wolfman and Frankenstein and Dracula and Bride of Frankenstein, mm -hmm. Black mm -hmm. and all these things and all like that. So that the the Universal monsters are also like a very very big important um, influence to me. And what what I learned from them that I carry through uh, uh, as a writer as a creator now. Mm -hmm. The idea that things can be scary, things can be spooky, things can be horrifying. Um, it's about character and not just not just having protagonists that you care about. Did you did you care if they survive? Did you care if they, oh, sure. they, they, yeah. they make it? Did you care if they prosper? Mm -hmm. um, it's about having empathy for a villain, too. It's about not necessarily siding with the villain, not, not necessarily... Uh, 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 B believing in the same ethos that they believe if they are after out for revenge or if they're sure. out for, for whatever. Um, it's not that it's, it's just about understanding that that is a person as well. And that certain circumstances or situations led them to be the villain of the story. Okay. Right. 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 And that's the thing yeah. universal studios did with Frankenstein, Dracula, family mm -hmm. opera uh, not as so much dracula dracula is kind of a tool dracula just <laughs> is a jerk right we always joke about that on the podcast but the wolfman um creature from black lagoon all these oh, yeah. they're misunderstood they are outsiders in our in our world they don't belong they don't look right they don't you know right um, and and they've been forced into a in backed into a place where they they end up lashing out and doing bad things but you sympathize with them and you un you, you feel but you feel bad for them and that makes 
for a really interesting story. And that's something that no sure. one else like uh, 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 Paramount and MGM and RKO and stuff. None, none of the other studios that were making horror at the time that Universal was quite figured out that formula the same way. They right. never got there. Like if you, Island of Lost Souls with Charles Lawton mm -hmm. um, is an incredible horror film. We've talked about it on the podcast. I love it. It's, it's a beautifully made film. But you don't quite you don't quite root for you kind of root for the 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 the, the, the men you know the, the are we not men people but mm -hmm. you're not really on charles on side he's just a jerk right. so yeah so yeah. so you miss something that that is the the one non-universal film I'd, I'd mentioned maybe would be uh uh is it rko i can't remember made uh hunchback in Notre Dame, the charles lawn one where you were right. quasimodo but you quasimodo does horrible things but you you understand why he does them you understand what a misfit is you understand how how ostracized he is him. yeah so so that's a big footprint in my evolution as someone who creates writing content film, whatever you want to call it at this point. Um, yeah, that, that's a, that's a big step. Um, and my, and then uh, my mom who was not super into the horror thing. Right. At, at the same time she did, I was, when I was really young, she, she went to a, a church flea market and she bought me a book about monster makeup. Okay. She just, that she found and had a drawing of 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 uh, Frankenstein and the Frankenstein monster and, and the Wolfman on it, and she she gave it to me, and I became obsessed with 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 makeup and obsessed with making monsters and obsessed with making myself up and everything. Um, and and that that was maybe the first moment where I was looking at the films I liked, mm -hmm. and then stepping behind it and analyzing like. People made these. People yeah, made the, yeah, these makeups. Right. People people filmed these stories. People wrote these stories. The idea that 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 it's it, there's a village behind each of these things I love mm -hmm. that are responsible for the fact that I get to enjoy them and stuff. And that's that would I would cite that as that 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 one book my mom bought me. Mm -hmm. um, I was third fourth grade I think. Um, as the moment I was like, I could. I you're talking about like uh, uh, reading Chandler like. There's a moment mm. where it's like, I could do this. I could, and then, right, and that right. set off, you know, I, I happened to, we, you know, you know, I, you know, I kind of grew up in the, in the, uh, the home, the advent of the home video generation too. Pretty That's much. That's the other thing is like, like we could, my buddy Mike got one of those VHS cameras that had the deck you had to carry <laughs> right. on your, on right. your, on your, over your shoulder. Yeah. Um, and we started making stuff and then he and I made our first two films to, together that got a uh, feature dis distribution. So nice. um, That's awesome. That's, you know, it's, it's about, you know, you, you experiment and you practice until you're ready to just put it out there oh, for yeah. the world to, to love yeah. or hate, yeah. which quite often happens. And, yep. and now yep. you've, now you've stepped in the ring and now you're, yep. now you're, now you're doing it. Yep. And that's one of the crazy parts about being an artist is that, is that you, you work, most of us anyways, work so long at just being ready to get it to be seen by other people. Yeah. And yeah. then it gets seen and then it gets nervous. <laughs> yeah, right, right. Yeah, you're not sure. You're not sure. Yeah. Um, it's it's hard to divorce yourself from the context of of this thing you created mm -hmm. that you obviously are happy with. I mean, hopefully you like you get to a point where you're happy with it and now you're ready to put it out there. And if you haven't gotten to that point, maybe maybe you should hold off. You should, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You don't like it, yeah. right? Yeah. But 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 there's also the other side where you're like, you have the imposter syndrome where you're like, I don't know, maybe it sucks. I have no idea. And and the truth of it is, having released a couple books and having released a bunch of films, um, our art is about context and art is about the context people bring to it. And very often, I do believe people have decided if they're going to like or not like something before they've even read it or, or watched it. Sure. It's a yeah. weird side psychosis of our, of our, at least our culture, if not human culture. Maybe, right. Maybe it's just American or Western culture. I don't know. But... Um, you have to you, then part of be doing what we do, I think, is preparing yourself mentally and emotionally for the fact that some people are going to absolutely hate oh. what you what you just did, what you just spent all that time with. They're they're going to absolutely yeah. hate it, and yeah. and by by extension, they're going to they're going to kind of hate you for doing it. Right, and, no, and that's a maybe a more, it, more modern uh, uh, side effect of social media or, or pop culture right yeah, now. But, you know, I, but, I was seriously, yeah. I was just about to bring social media into it because yeah. I, I really do feel like um, what artists have heard, suffered, gone through for 
hundreds of years, all of a sudden, just general people are now going through on social media on a regular basis. Yeah. Because you post something and all of a sudden you get some kind of message filled with hate about it's a, it. It's and evaluated like it's a piece. It's a thing you, yeah, because it is the thing yeah. you created. Uh, and yeah, even like no, a dumb true. post is something you did create. Let's, and let's you are it. posting yeah. it socially, so you know. For sure. I, I mean, I get that aspect of it completely. Yeah. But, yeah. But it's but it's you know when you generally speaking when you say something at a at a dinner table with friends yeah. and acquaintances usually you don't expect to get hit back with vitriol at oh, at, at the oh, table not. you're the right right, right. I, yeah, yeah. and or and, or at the very least it's going to be like two people it's not going to be like 150 people right right, right. and uh, yeah. you know or 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 somebody hits you back with vitriol and all of a sudden that's getting liked a whole bunch and you're like <laughs> yeah 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 wait yeah, a minute yeah. <laughs> so yeah no, it's it, it, it's the it's I don't know if it's like the democratization of creation or or what it is. It's yeah. it's, it's everything is very public um, yeah. it, lately, and and I do feel like, I mean, and we're but, talking just about like a post, but but when you're actually, it's tough. It's tough when you are doing something publicly, and and I'll tell you honestly, I'll post a picture of my cat doing something, and I'll post a link to something I wrote that I spent a lot of time on. And frankly, oh. the cat thing, way more, way more way popular, more. Way, way more, more. way more engaging way more. I, because it's instantaneous. It doesn't require the the effort to make a click, the effort to make, to take a minute to read it and stuff. And I think that that's a, that instant gratification is always going to win somehow. Jim, we're both writers. Okay. And um, I see writers all the time on Instagram post, pieces of their writing yeah and just think oh geez <laughs> what, yeah <laughs> what are you doing like oh like, you, you can't you, you you can't get people to read your book let alone spend spend a minute reading what you just posted when they can just flip right i mean you it's, it's unfortunate what you said about your cat versus versus yeah. you know the writing but it's it's absolutely true i mean that that's why you know instagram right now is pushing reels like crazy they want mm. i mean if it was up to them right now it, it would just be reels rather yeah. than yeah, yeah, rather yeah, than yeah, posts yeah. and it but it's uh, again it's just because of that you know instant gratification up 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 but but the one thing i don't know with with the with the judgment the one thing i will add to that is that is that I agree with with everything both of us said here, but at the same time, haters are going to hate regardless. Yes, absolutely. If you, if you don't do it, they'll get on you for not doing it. If you don't do it well, they'll get on you for not doing it well. And if you do it well, they'll tell you you didn't do it well. So it's like you, you can't worry about it at the end of the day. Just do your thing, you know? You you, you can't allow that to factor into it. You you. If you're going to do this, you have to this any kind of creation. And that's kind the of, thing. Of, yeah. Thing. yeah. You have to do it because you've got to do it. Yeah. If, yeah. if if you don't have to do it, I always say you'll find a million other ways to spend your time. That'll be less frustrating, more profitable, oh, yeah. probably in the long <laughs> run. You know, um, yeah. in the in the culture we're in right now, you have to do it because you got it. You've got to do it or, mm -hmm. or because like me you don't really have a whole lot of other useful uh, skill sets in life. <laughs> I mean, I mean, this is really, this is the, this is the thing I do much more uh, competently than I do most other things in life. And, and I've just defaulted into this and this is now it's like 20 years in. So what am I going right. to do? <laughs> like, right. I'm right, right. Um, right. Uh, in fairness to the post thing, my cat is very cute. So, you know, right. I, I, I don't blame and, him for being I, more popular than my writing. And, and, and I think that the internet, likes cats more than just about anything else i think that's been shown so it's not to like i get it it's yeah. okay i don't resent the guy he's okay <laughs> but but yeah i know i know uh it is funny it it is funny being a a content a, a creator in in this era it's and i think i don't think michelangelo or raymond chandler or um you know sam beckett or or whomever um i you wonder what how they would have subsisted in this era you just wonder like yeah. like michelangelo spends like what is it like six years or 12 years i don't even know like like carving the david in secret and he unveils it and someone's like 
no, the head looks kind of big, you know, <laughs> like just like that. Like it takes so much effort to create yeah. something. And not, yeah. this is not to whine or minge or anything. This is just, this is the fact of the matter. It is. It takes so long and so much effort to create something. And it takes very little time and very little effort to knock that down. Oh yeah. It, I mean, whether you're right or wrong I, in your criticism, it doesn't matter. The point is that it takes very, very much less uh, inertia to just like chip away at something than it does to carve it in the first place. Without question. But that's just the yeah. nature of it. Yeah. 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 Um, I find myself funny enough thinking of Eminem when you say that, because he has numerous songs on his last mm -hmm. few albums about this critic that didn't like this and this critic that didn't like that. And there's there, that's the problem as an artist is that, whoever's criticizing what it is that you've done, you have no idea if they can do it and they probably can't. So yeah. then it doesn't really matter. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. yeah. And but yet, no one can really do what you do. I mean, the, if, yeah. if you've really figured out your own niche, then you're the only person that can do that thing. Whether mm -hmm. it's like, I do this certain type of, of, of poetry or I do this certain mm -hmm. type of, uh, filmmaking or, or whatever dance or whatever it doesn't matter um so the uh, idea is the world's never going to have that unless you do it right yeah you've and brought you've brought something out of absolute nothing and that's what creation is that's it's, yeah it's oh a, without it's question a, it's yeah. a gift we we, yeah. we get to do and yeah it comes with whatever other attendant negative I, factors but hey you know i think it was morgan freeman i think it was morgan freeman pretty sure uh who said that uh Never take criticism from somebody you wouldn't take advice from. And oh, that's good. I, that, right? Yeah. <laughs> that's yeah. that's a pretty solid one. So, you know. I like that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, my, my, my personal motto has always uh, been, uh, you know, I, I, my mom raised me to be polite. So I, I'm always going to listen to your advice before I completely ignore it. <laughs> right. Exactly. Sorry. Yeah. Right. I, I, right. I grew up headstrong assuming I knew better. And, and I found out that in a lot of cases I was right. I did know better. So. You know, that's just going to be my, my thing. And, and, and I'll live and die by that. And if, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. if, if maybe yeah. I wasn't right or something like that, I, I think the right choice for you is different from the right choice in a perfect right. way. Right, right. Well, and that's the thing. I mean, when, when you make the choice, even if it's not a conscious choice per se, but when you make the decision or the, whatever it is to, to, to be an artist, there's a, there's a lot that goes with that. You know, there's, there's a lot, there's a lot of baggage and a lot of, a lot of, a lot of sub genres out there. <laughs> yeah. You know, and, 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 even, and even it, when it, it comes to your friends and your spouses and things like that. I mean, I it's there's just going to say that it influences the other people in your mm -hmm. life too. Like you yeah, made a commitment to a pursuit that, that is, it's usually based on the fact that like, there are not immediate rewards for it. Yeah. You know? Um, so, so yeah, you know, I, I spent, so I'm 48 now. Mm -hmm. uh, I graduated at 22 from the Savannah College of Art and Design, uh, went into illustration, um, lived in New York for a few years, did some, did some work in comics, didn't really manage to, to knock, knock the roof off, uh, okay. uh, came back to Pittsburgh and started showing in galleries. And I showed in galleries for another couple of years until I moved to LA. And, and during that gallery time, I started uh, getting back into filmmaking. Um, right. Moved out to LA. I was a, I was a PA for a couple of years. I got to I got to be a PA on some really cool shows. I got to be I was the production assistant and assistant to Reba McIntyre on her TV okay. show. Reba, yeah. Uh, I got I worked with Bob Saget. I worked with uh, Sybil Shepherd. I worked with like some real icons. And I always mm -hmm. had I was lucky. I had very good experiences with all of these people that had lived in the public view for quite some time at this point. But all of them. Um, but still, like that's. I think I, I think I made 450 a week on Reba or something at that point, mm -hmm. which for, for like 12 hour days, five, 12 hour days, you know, um, a flat fee, uh, which is not quite enough to live on in LA, even, even in 2006, oh, yeah. that, seven, that was not enough to live on. In LA. No. So, so I, I struggled for a long time and, and following that, I mean, I had, I had ups and downs. I lived in my car for a couple months. I, I, I lived in the back of a movie theater for a while, mm -hmm. uh, struggled. I sold, my DVDs, I sold toys. I sold, I sold anything I could at some points just so I could, you know, there's, there's struggling. And then there's like, how the hell am I going to eat until next Thursday? Struggling. Right. Like that, yeah. That's a different, those are different things. Yeah. Like, that's yeah. like, that's like, I have no food. I have nothing. I don't know what to do. <laughs> that's terrifying. 
and I borrowed money from my mom mm-hmm. and I borrowed, you know, some money from my, my brother, let me some money every once in a while and stuff. Not much. I usually managed to, to hack it out on my own and stuff, but, but um, that's my, my point being that, that it, it affects the people around you. Your choices affect these people around you and, and your lifestyle uh, um, uh, has, has repercussions. And, and, you know, even to the point where like, like, finally when i started like i got married and i started doing better and stuff like that like i had a dental insurance in 15 years so like there was a lot of like fixing that needed to be done and shit man like 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 it was you know things were rough for me for a while and 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 the the one thing i will say about la somewhere living somewhere like la mm-hmm. is that you're not in, in a town like this you're not the only one doing that there are a lot oh, of no. people hustling and struggling and, and trying to make it and stuff like that that does make a lot of people desperate and 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 make them sometimes sketchy to to be honest um but 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 at least you don't feel like you're alone you don't feel like you're like a, a misfit sure you're, you're part sure. of like sure um, whatever an echelon and, of people that are trying to be up and coming and, and and not all of them make it like like and i and i get that because because and this is going to sound paradoxical first but it's not I'm a, I'm a native Angelino. Yeah. So it's always funny because people, people are like, Oh, there's actually people that are you know, <laughs> born here. That, they're, we're born here. Know. That's weird. Yeah. Right. <laughs> and, but, but the thing is, is as, as a native Angelino, you see so many people come to LA yes. to quote unquote, make it, you know, Puts and, dreams, and, yeah. and they end up as, you know, as they came to be a producer or director, a, a, you know, a director for, t- a photography and actress and they end up being a waitress or yeah. you know whatever it might be a lifeguard and that's that's okay it, it, it's just that right. you you see so much of it when you're there like when you grow yeah. up with it you know that these people are are all around you even though they're not from there and then you know and you're like oh i grew up you know three blocks over there and <laughs> yeah. so it's 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 an interesting dichotomy being able to witness it when you are there Cause you're not just struggling, you're struggling in a strange place. Mm-hmm. So there's that, there's yeah. that as well. Like you're also like, wait, La Brea and, 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 and like sunset meet up actually somewhere. Like, wait, hang <laughs> right. on. Like, how does that work? You know? Yeah. You're, you're, you're trying to orient yourself at the same time. You're trying to, you know, struggle. Um, especially back in the days before Waze or, or, or uh, Google maps and stuff when you're, when you're uh, trust me, uh, my first job, my real first job in LA was I was a courier for studio. So I'd pick up uh-huh. um, tapes or, or whatever from like, say Sony BMG. And I would take them to like a post house somewhere in the Valley or something like that. So I go from like, right. like Santa Monica to the Valley right. in, at, at, at nine o'clock in the morning, which takes like, if you haven't lived in LA, that takes like an hour and 45. Minutes. Oh yeah. <laughs> That's a ridiculous drive by the way. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, but, but I did, I learned my way, but the only way to navigate at that point was the Thomas guy. Oh, right. So, so uh, you're, yeah. You're, I remember you're Thomas guy very well. Yes. Big on a book <laughs> trying to triangulate where you're trying to go. And then you have to map away on something like that. So we were like, they're spoiled now. I'm just going to say there's, yeah. Oh yeah. But, but, um, uh, I'm a big fan yeah. of ways though, personally. <laughs> what I way ways almost killed me like two times in a row. So oh, okay. I know I just do Google maps, but okay. Just, okay. I, I'm not necessarily concerned about shaving off four minutes on my, my drive. If it means yeah. I have to like cut across like, like six lanes of traffic. I'm yeah. not, I'll, I'll take the six minutes. It's okay. Yeah. I'll leave it yeah. No, it does that where, where you're like, you get off here and drive for two streets and then get back on the freeway. And then you look at it and it saved you like 20 seconds. And you're yeah. Like, yeah. And you made, no. and you had to make three left turns against traffic. No, like, no, no, no I don't. Yeah, I don't care. Yeah, <laughs> I drive a really old. I have a 1973 or 75, I should say, uh, Chevy Nova. So I drive. I drive an old classic car, and uh, it doesn't have AC. So I'm more about. They they talk about uh, they talk about like uh, 280 air conditioning, which is where you 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 roll the two windows down and you drive mm-hmm. 80 miles an hour. Right, so you get right. The air going yeah. through. So yeah. so I'd rather not stop. I'd rather just keep rolling. <laughs> that's my that's my. Opinion. That's funny. First first car. I, I ever that's had. right we talked about our cars that one time that's yeah right. first 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 car i ever had was a 76 76 nova uh oh wow it was like that rust color oh right <laughs> and, and it was a six cylinder but five worked um <laughs> yeah. 
it, it, it got me around LA. All right. But yeah, yeah. that's cool. That's cool. Mine used <laughs> to be blue. Mine was originally blue apparently when someone bought it, but when I got it and I've repainted it, it's a, uh, it's black and Frankenstein green. So there you go. Okay. That's, that's my ride. Okay. That's, so that's the town's mobile. So, so talk to me here. Um, what about since you've been in the industry, which is what 11, 12 years now, something like that. 20. Cool. Oh, okay. So, how has since, since my first film i i should say yeah right, i made right. my first film 20 years ago yeah. so how has the uh how has the industry changed Ooh, um in that time because i you know we've gone from from basic cable to you know yeah. the, the higher price services to now we're streaming and then there was the COVID shutdown and right how's you know and the theaters kind of got exiled there for a while how's how is how yeah. has the industry changed in that time um, that's interesting. You know, you know, I work in the indie world. I don't, mm, right. I don't do studio films. I, I do smaller budget indie films. Um, so that's its own kind of animal. Yeah. I would, I will, I will say the, the absolute main, uh, uh, cosmic shift that's happened since I started making films versus now is, is that social, is that, um, physical media has, uh, changed. I'm not going to say it's gone away. It's changed. Okay. Uh, Physical media, DVDs, Blu-rays, what have you, um, had become kind of a niche market now. In okay, the old yeah. days, when you when you made a film and got it distributed, uh, the only way it, it, it happened, I mean, mo most indie films did not play theatrically. You would do like a theatrical engagement. Like I would play at like one or two theaters in LA for a week or so. Mm -hmm. And that's usually mm -hmm. actually just so you can do what's called four walling. It, it's so that you're eligible for certain uh, uh, film awards okay. if you've actually played within the Los Angeles area. Gotcha. Um, <clears throat> so my films would play a little bit, but mainly they would just go out on, on video. They would go out on VHS and uh, not VHS. They would go out on DVD and, and Blu-ray. And you actually make the distributor has to pay for the manufacturer of those, that physical media. Okay. Sure. Yeah. But, um, and that's an X amount of cost that they charge against whatever profits you're going to make. Obviously, they have to recoup that. But the money you make on physical media used to be really good. Uh, my first yeah. my first solo feature, House of Bad, came out in 2011. Um, it got uh, picked up in Walmart and, and across the country and Walmart sold the heck out of it. Um, and we fought to keep it in Walmart through the holiday. And I'm telling you, like those even those discount $5 uh, Walmart bins that did you see? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You make money on that, and we okay. did really, really good on just that. Um, in the space of that, to well, then I, I I did a film in 2014 that that is just now about to come out, like next year. It got delayed quite a few years, but oh, wow. for all sorts of reasons. Uh, but um, uh, that system changed, and physical media really did go away as as streaming became prevalent. Right. Um, you do make quite a bit less on streaming yeah so what's what's happened is that the industry has gone back to the way it was almost before home video where if you don't get a large theatrical uh, release in in the united states your only hope to really make money is in foreign territory and that's how like a lot of foreign films that's a, do you know de Laurentiis? like all those films he made like conan the barbarian and all all this right. stuff like that guy was a master at, at making deals for showing those films in other territories in South Africa Good and Bosnia him. and, and, and China and all these other <laughs> of Korea and everything like that. And that's how that, that guy made tons of money doing that. He was brilliant at doing that kind of thing. Um, and now like, we're kind of back to that. Like, like you'll make X amount of, of recoup on your budget on, on streaming, but you, if you can hold on to your international rights, that's really where, where it's at. And I'm, gotcha. I'm fortunate in that I do have like certain interesting followings in, in, I have a Belgian contingent that somehow my films are really popular in Belgium. And I have that's one awesome. big fan. My, my buddy Jeronen uh, uh, is, is a big fan and he's turned a bunch of other people on. So, so if I can get it in some of these other territories in Eastern, Eastern Europe's a big one. Um, uh, uh, Australia is a big one. Um, okay, yeah. You can you can do pretty well, but that's the, right. the trick. Um, I just finished a film called uh, The Beast Inside, yeah, uh, which yeah. stars Sadie Katz and Vernon Wells, who is in Commando, and he's the Mohawk guy in um, mm -hmm. in uh, Road Warrior. Uh, he's the, yeah. the big, you know, crazy guy on the motorcycle. Uh, that's Vernon, man, back in the day. Who, by the way, he had great stories to tell about making Road oh, Warrior. I said, oh my, my AD's like, we need to be going. I'm like, hang on, he's telling me a story about Road Warrior. <laughs> um, 
God, because I grew up loving that movie. Um, uh, <clears throat> um, but we just finished that, and um, and it's possible this might be my first one that comes out that will never have a physical media release. And it's kind of like right <sighs> coming from our generation, right? The home yeah. video era, like we were saying, it's like like is it even a film if it's not on a <laughs> right. physical right. media? If you can't have it on your shelf, like I'm looking right here, you, mm-hmm. you can't see, but I've got a, just a rows of shelf of all my DVDs and Blu-rays right here, sure. which are totally not organized. I have, I have to hunt and hunt and hunt. If I'm looking for the hunt for Red October, I have to hunt for 10 minutes to find the hunt for Red October, actually. It's just, it's buried somewhere next to a million other Wolverine and and, and Friday the 13th, the series, right? Yeah. Um, but uh, but it's it's the 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 conduit to which it reaches the viewer any film has reached the viewer has changed dramatically yeah. and and in cha- in that change it's changed the way you make films and 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 it's changed like what can you make a film for what budget right fifty thousand hundred thousand dollars two hundred thousand dollars two hundred fifty thousand dollars um they're just going to recoup that yeah it's yeah, all ba- it's all uh, based on recouping that otherwise no totally one's giving you the yeah. money to do it because yeah the thing is a writer, you know, you, you and I, like when we write something, we're investing our own time Big and time. that that's the, that's the collateral we're, we're putting in, in this creative endeavor. Right. Um, and that's worth X amount. That's not, that's not to say that's not whatever. That's not valuable. Of course it is. Um, you make a film and you need to pay your yeah. DP and you need to pay your AC and you of need course. to pay for yeah. locations and permits and food and everything like that. So <clears throat> if you can't do that yourself, which most filmmakers can't, then you've got mm-hmm. to get someone to, to give you, they're basically, they're, you're it, selling yeah. air. They're giving you money based on something that, that might work or might not work. You might yeah. not make a dime. Yeah. You're, you don't know. Um, your actor could go on a racist tirade, which has happened to someone I know. <laughs> your, your, your actor could go on a racist tirade two weeks before the film comes out and <laughs> no one's going to watch your film because they don't want to support the actor. Yeah. You know, yeah. everyone else who worked on the film suffers yeah. from that one person's right bad behavior of course um uh so it's it's it is you're you're it's a it's a total bet um so the you know the 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 great side of filmmaking and if i can finish this up and and, and i know i've been going on and on um the great side of filmmaking is that when you do it you have a team that you do it with and in the best of circumstances that's amazing because it's like a little family that you've gathered together um that you have a great time working very very hard with Mm-hmm. And you create something that you're all proud of. It's wonderful. On the flip side of that, the great thing about being a writer is that you don't have to depend on anyone else. You just, it's all you. It's its all to your credit if you succeed and it's all to your fault if you don't. Yeah, and, you know. And it's something said for both of those things. You just kind of walked right into my next question because what I was going to say is that I find it impressive and at the same time a little weird that that you can do something as collaborative as be a director at the same time as write fiction where when when you're writing fiction it's everything is in your head it's yeah. all in your head and you don't need anybody to agree with you right in any way shape or form everything is here and it comes out on the page and then you argue with yourself yes but but that's it whereas as a director you have you know whatever it might be whether it, regardless of the size of the film you you've yeah got, you've got you know scores of people right that, that you need to somehow make happy with and those two th- things seem seem so paradoxical to me so how how do you how do you reconcile that well the the good i'll say the good side the good thing about being the director is that at least usually on set <laughs> right um I get to say how things are going to go and people go, okay, that's how we're right. going to do yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah, right. Unless, unless I've got a producer on set that has some other ideas and then we have to have a discussion and that does happen, but it, it's usually pretty good. Um, here, here's the similarity that I'll point out to you is, is what happens in, in a film and with, with writing is you get to a point where you are 95, well, you know, 95% done with the book or the film. Mm-hmm. Uh, you've turned in your, your draft uh, of your your final draft of the book to your publisher, or you've turned in your final cut of your film to your producers. Right. And that's when a lot of times someone comes in and goes, you know what? Here's how I'm going to fix this. Yeah. Right. I believe it. Because yeah. because you you've taken the the ball to the one yard line, right? Mm-hmm. You've done all that heavy lifting to get it there. Mm-hmm. 
And now someone's going to come in and go, if, if I'll, I'll say, if you get the right person, this is a g- g- wonderful fluid experience. Like, sure. like uh, Jason Henderson, who produced uh, blood sucker city, the editing of, of that book. Once I turned in the, the, the final draft was, was a pleasurable, wonderful experience. And we did great. Um, um, and I've had producers. I've, I've been maybe a little less lucky with producers than that. And at that point, um, <laughs> because that is the point where someone will come in after you've done, like I said, all the heavy lifting and go, sure. Here's yeah. what I think would improve this. And you're like, no. right. right. But yeah. But, and, you're, and, and you're like, you, you weren't, sometimes you weren't, those suggestions are helpful, but sometimes you're just like, Dude, you weren't you're, here you're, from, from a through, right, through right, Y. And then all of a sudden, right, wait, right. What? and now, and now you have ideas. Like, right. like yeah. Yeah. those ideas would have been really well expressed on day two of the shoot. <laughs> right but now, it, it, it's the problem of uh, <clears throat> it's the problem of trying to fix something mm. that's almost all the all the way built. Right. If if you want to make an adjustment while something's being built at the beginning stage, that's one thing. But if you try and go back once the thing's really manufactured and there's a whole thing with with a thousand, ten thousand, a hundred thousand moving parts, and you tweak one part that affects all the other parts. That's the problem. Right. Um, and very often these people you deal with right at the end are not necessarily creative people. They are business people. They're people oh, who understand yeah. uh, something that appeals to a certain demographic or they're people that understand what, what is popular right now or they were like mm-hmm. that. And mm-hmm. they're going to try and mold the thing you've created into something else. Right. They're, they're going to take your square peg and try and fit it around hole. So to right, speak. right, right. Um, yeah, of course. Yeah. And it's very easy to break the spine of the thing you've created by doing that. So you, sure. that's where the creator, uh, there, you know, it's tough. There's moments where the creator just, you have to stand your ground and you have to go, wait, 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 hang on. You right. Know, we have right. to, and it's, it's not even about pride. It's about taking a step back and, 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 and protecting the work itself. And that's, something i try to do i i'm hey i'm guilty of having an ego and i know that and people i work with will <laughs> maybe attest to that but but at the end of the day it, it's i feel like my job once i'm almost there to the to that point mm-hmm. is to protect the the thing the creation the film or the book or whatever like that the the integrity of the thing right um right and and if that's if that can be shifted a little bit here and there and stuff like that, and I don't feel like it, it affects the overall thing, then great. Okay. Then, you know, fine. If right. that little thing helps us, whatever like that, right. like you gotta be, you gotta be a big enough person to let go of a few things. Cause that's just, that is the nature of being collaborative. And that's the nature of, of being creative in a business of being creative. Right. Um, but, but then there's, there's a moment where you have to step back and go, wait, no, hang on. Right. All right. And, and and as a creator, I'm just trying to speak to maybe some people listening to us that might be in this situation now. Like as a creator, like I find that the best argument is that if you can, if you have to say no to something, have a really good reason why you're saying no. Like, mm-hmm. no, this doesn't work. And here's why. Right. It's not just this is not just me being egotistical. Right. This is me saying no, right. it doesn't work. Because if you do this, then this, 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 this all falls apart. It's the house of cards comes down. So that's that's the that's the thing I found to be most successful in my career. And that's the thing I would I would recommend to anyone. Just like like be ready for the be ready for the dumbest thing to come at you. Right. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. and and um and, and have a have a reason why you're objecting. Sure. And, you know, actually, it's funny you mentioned that because I just watched a TCM special recently that was on the films of the 1970s. And there were a ton of phenomenal films made in the 1970s. But they also talked about how much creativity the directors in the 70s were given to kind of tell the story the way they wanted it told that was kind of the last auteur generation yeah i I, I would argue in filmmaking and stuff it's it's been very until like the indie world kind of happened Mm -hmm. um uh you had like guys like frankenheimer and 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 people that were just and 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 um uh uh, Cronenberg, you know, mm-hmm. they, they really were like realizing a vision and stuff with 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 less interference is interesting. The, well, this, what happened well, is you, the studio system had collapsed, so right. they didn't know what to do. So so like Gulf Oil was owned studios at that point, and right. they were like, I don't know, like like maybe it's just a write off. Who the 
knows you know so so yeah Even, go, make, go make king kong you know with jeff bridges right, right. and and we'll see what happens yeah. i saw that i saw that in the uh the uh it wasn't a, it was a drive-in i saw it in yeah. drive-in. oh really oh just galang yeah yeah yeah, yeah. 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 um Dino yeah. Dino again we're talking yeah. but even coppola i mean you yeah. know with like apocalypse now where yeah. everything his whole life was falling apart and everything was <laughs> he was broke and you know uh is his stars having a having a heart attack heart and, attack yeah yeah, yeah. tell had a heart or no uh uh Okay, oh, tell was the original guy, and then yeah, they they, they, they cut him, guy. and they brought in um, Martin Sheen, and Martin Sheen, Sheen had a yeah. heart attack, which I'm sure had nothing to do with cocaine. <laughs> no. It was the '70s. It, it, like, it was it was a Wild West, and that this is when this is when King's writing Cujo in like a weekend, right? Like it was like 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 72 hours or something like that of like no sleep and just wrote it on thing. Didn't even remember writing it. It's incredible. It's a great story. <laughs> But that guy just yeah, yeah. Speaking of King again, I know it's the seventies. Yeah, yeah. It was it was a special time. I I don't <laughs> I don't remember much from it. I remember watching a lot of Sesame Street. But um, yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. And, and then into seventy eight or something like that. Yeah, yeah. I was starting to like start to really enjoy like Close to Counters, the third kind, and stuff like that. My mm-hmm. parents took me to see Poltergeist in the drive-in. I loved I, Poltergeist. I really did. To the sh- to the shame of this present filmmaker, I made them go home. I was like, nope. Nope, nope, not doing it. I was like, wow, I mean, was like four. Okay, okay. So I think I was four. I was okay, like, so so it I, was a double feature. It started off with something else, and then went to Poltergeist. And once Poltergeist happened, I was like, I I need to leave. They're <laughs> here, right? No, the the uh, oh, oh, okay. So for me, that movie was Jaws. I saw Jaws. Oh, yeah. I I saw Jaws when I was six, and it messed me up forever. Yeah. For. You know, like I'm never putting on scuba equipment and going down there ever, like ever. Really, that's interesting. It, um, it, it, me and 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 I have a fr- I have a good friend Molly. I go way back with and stuff, and she's obsessed with Jaws and stuff. And she she's a scuba diver and and a, and a sailor. And she and I have gone like like swimming and stuff. It's really it's funny. Like like she's swam she's actually swam with sharks. I'm like oh. Okay, so so I had so I I was talking to my mom. But I'm never swimming day. in a swimming pool with skeletons though. <laughs> right? No. No. I, I was talking with my mom the other day and she told, she mentioned to me that, cause I, I told her that, you know, she did that. They did my dad and she did that to me for yeah. Jaws. Yeah. And I was going to ask you what yours was, but hers, she said was house of wax. She, oh, Vincent Price. She yeah. saw it when she was five years old and she said she's 75 now. Okay. Yeah. She saw it when she was five years old and she says it still like gives her the creeps. Like when she thinks about it, it the- still, we 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 haven't touched on House of Wax in, on the podcast because it's a little after our 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 the Borgo Pass Horror podcast. We we focus on maybe maybe twenties, thirties, and forties, right? Uh, mostly Universal films. We're really kind of focused on the Universal stuff, but we'll do a few other things. And one of the other films we did, uh, speaking of remakes, um, is a nineteen thirty three film called Mystery of the Wax Museum, directed by mm-hmm. Michael Curtiz, who directed Casablanca. Um, and Robin Hood and, and, and quite a few other films um, and uh, starring Lionel Adwell. And it's, it's basically house of wax. It's the pre it's the, you know, and it was shot in this amazing two strip technicolor process, which has uh-huh. this, it's early color. So it's, it's weird. It looks almost colorized, but it wasn't <laughs> right. But, right. but um, it's the, the precursor to, to Vincent Price's uh, 1950s film. Obviously. Okay. But um, what I, what I was talking about when we did that episode we're talking about is, is that what you've got is these wax figures and then inevitably when they melt and you see, it's like, it's like taught in um, Raiders of the Lost Ark. It's, mm-hmm. it's yeah. You, you yeah. The, the face is melting away and it's, it's phantasmagoric. It's really horrifying looking and they got away with it because they're not real people, but you're basically seeing a human being melt away. Right. And that is very, I don't blame your mom. Oh my God. I wonder if your mom saw it in 3d. I, I, that film was in 3D. I, don't, I don't know. I can't even imagine in 3D. That'd be horrifying. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So, so here, here's, here's a question for you. And I realize it's unfair because you have an encyclopedia up there of, of horror films, but I'm going to ask you it anyway. Um, because for those people that end up watching this, that, that may not be aficionados like you, give me a horror film that is not going to be a mainstream top 25 kind mm-hmm. of listed film that people just you, you gotta see it tremors 1990 okay um um it's it's 
when I go back and I, I think about what are actually, what are my favorite horror films? What are the ones I watched the most? What are the ones I enjoyed the most actually? I, I came to a realization about a year ago that was like, they're mostly horror comedies. I right, actually right, really right. love I, yeah, the yeah, fun yeah. Of, of that. So, so, so Bubba Hotep, uh, Evil Dead movies. Yeah, oh things. yeah. The things yeah. that mix fun in with the, with the scariness. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they Campy. give you a break. It's it's, Campy. it's yeah. You can yeah exactly. But you can enjoy the 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 the, the grotesquery of it, and then get a relief by some sun. So I will say yeah, 1990 Tremors, Kevin Bacon, uh, um, Fred Ward. Uh, it, yeah, Fred Ward. Yeah, who just yeah. we just recently lost. Yeah, um, super entertaining, great idea, incredibly fun, good dialogue, great characters, really hilarious, um, but also like really good scary moments and stuff. Right, like, just right, an right. adventure of a film, stuff like that. Like, like I no, I really believe in. Um, there's been all this hubbub about um, is Hocus Pocus, and and now they they did the second one. Disney's releasing a, a sequel now. Um, are they horror movies? And people are like, oh, they're not really horror movies. They're not really that scary and stuff like that. It's like it's like. Everyone has to get into it somehow. And, and I got into it with, with, again, we're talking about horror comedies. Abbott and Costello meet Frankenstein. Come on. Right, like, yeah, yeah. You, you look at it now and you're like, there's nothing really that scary about Abbott and Costello meet Frankenstein. <laughs> but, like, it's, it's, but it's entertaining as heck. I mean, every moment. Um, you, can, you can judge things based on the merits of their era they came in and viewed through the context of a 2022 lens and whatever. Okay, fine. But, um, but I really believe that like anything, like, what, anything they like is a is a is a stepping stone like a gateway drug into into the genre is, is right. valid and yeah I, absolutely but i think i think tremors as far as the filmmaking thing so i quick story i told you i was a pa on uh, the reba mcintyre show right. um i did not grow up listening to country music that much mm -hmm. it wasn't really my thing it was mm -hmm. more iron maiden and other types right. of music um nothing wrong with it just it wasn't my thing um and then I moved to LA and, and suddenly I have this job and now I'm, and I'm interacting with, with, with Reba, with Reba Rector, who is a, who is a legitimate superstar, who is oh, like yeah. a, a serious thing, not in my world, but she is a thing. And I'm mm -hmm. aware of that. And one of my first one-on-one -on -one interactions with it was she would sign a bunch of uh, pictures of herself that they would give away on tape nights when we have a live studio audience and you'd, you'd, mm -hmm. they'd, they'd raffle them off and everything. And she'd sign like 10 of them every, you know. so, so at lunch, I, I, one day I, I bring them up and I'm like, this is our first conversation we've had. And she asked me about music and I was like, you know, I'm actually not, you know, that big a fan of country music, you know, right. I was like, but I was a, I'm a big fan of this film you did named Tremors. And she's like, Oh yeah, I remember that. That was, a, that was a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. and, and and then she told me this amazing story. She's like, you know, you know, I did that after my band died, right? And I'm like, cool. no, I don't know anything about this. And she, so Reba McIntyre was was going to, I'm going on a Reba McIntyre tangent here, but um, she was she was finished. She finished her show and she was going to another show and her whole band. Mm -hmm. And and Reba McIntyre's band was like there was like I don't know like nine or seventeen people in it. It was a big band, right? she somehow had a conflict and she had to take a different plane. So her, her whole band took one plane and then she came another Yikes. and her band's plane crashed and they all died. She lost her entire band. She lost all her, all these friends of hers. All, wow. everything. And after that, it was in the late eighties, I, I assume. And, and after that, um, her husband at the time, Narvel, she didn't want to really perform. She didn't want to do music for a while. She did really, you know, she was really crushed by this thing. And he suggested like, well, you've always wanted to do some movies. Maybe, you know, try this. Mm -hmm. And so, Cut, cut to 2007 and I'm having this conversation with there's six, I think and I'm having a conversation with uh -huh. Reba and she's like, you know about my band, right? I'm like, no. And she's like, well, my whole band died and I, you know, I didn't want to do music for a while. So, you know, I, I did this instead. And it was a lot of fun. She's like, I didn't really do the sequels though. I didn't like them. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's a, um, anyway, um, it was a great one-on-one -on -one experience. Like, wow. And then I actually got to work with um, uh, Michael Gross on something else too. So I worked with Bert Gummer from, who's the survivalist who's plays her husband. Right. I always right. really, I hoped I was actually going to get to work with Fred Ward at some point And I could, I could fulfill my, my tremors right, trifecta, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. but sadly not so much. So now I have to work with Kevin Bacon, I guess. Yeah. So, we'll see. And anyway, and Fred Ward just passed this year. So. He just, he just passed like about a year or within the last year. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I, I enjoyed his work quite a bit. I was, oh man. Was he good. was, he was an icon. He was great. Yeah. 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 He's one of those people like, 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 um, who, uh, Sid Haig just died uh, about two years ago, two three years ago too, and and it's one of those things where like some everyone saw someone very celebrated dies, and everybody has a good story about that person. Mm -hmm. Like everyone who who posts or talks about them, they have their own really 
they're their own story and it's a good story. And, and like, I think that's a good thing to, to try for, right? Oh, absolutely. Be that person, be the person who, that when you go, everyone's got a good story about you. No one's got a bad story. Like, just yeah. be that person. How hard is that? I don't know. Just be that person. Yeah. I'm with you. Yeah. All right, man. So, so listen up. We're going to end it here. Um, this has been, uh, this has been Starlight Podcast number four. This is Jim Towns. Uh, first off, want to let you know that he has first off a YouTube channel. Um, he has a very entertaining little, uh, well, I guess it's a series, uh, the, the 66 horror flicks. I watched a couple of those. Um, Spider was, baby freaked me out. I'm going to be my honest. first podcast series. That was like uh, the precursor to Bo- 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 yeah, yeah. That, that one freaked me out a little bit. Uh, and, uh, he's also got a WordPress site. Um, so, so, so check that out. Um, he's that's, got... that's now just jimtowns.com. You can, uh, okay, good. You can just go to jimtowns.com and, and excellent. It's a and then collection course... of writings and, and there's yeah. links to, uh, some of my short stories that are posted elsewhere too. Yeah. And then he's also got the Borgo pass, uh, horror podcast, uh, that he does every couple of weeks too. So, yeah. um, check that out and, um, uh, and thank you so much for being here with us. Uh, Starlight Pulpcast, uh, episode five will be out in two weeks. Obviously, we got the website. We got some merch. We got uh, submissions are open. If you're a writer and you are interested in any of the subgenres of no, of of pulp, any of them, adventure, like like he was talking about with the with the um, you know Indiana Jones stuff in the '80s that go went back to the '30s and '40s, right? Uh, so we're looking for adventure. We're looking for noir. We're looking for detective stories. We're looking for westerns. We're looking for science fiction. Okay. Um, if you're a writer and you're interested in that submit, okay. Go to starlightpulp.com. Uh, thank you so much for being here, Jim, hang out for a minute and, uh, thank you. everybody else. I'll see you in a couple weeks. Thanks so much. Thanks everybody. In this topsy